And this is Theory of Change. I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for joining me for another episode. This one is a very special one because I'm excited to announce that here at Flux, we are adding another podcast to our network. It is the Electorette podcast hosted by Jennifer Taylor Skinner. And I wanted to bring her here on Theory of Change today to have a more topical-based discussion and also to talk about her program as well. So I'm really excited about that. And the topic that we're going to be discussing today is the recent announcement by Kentucky Senator Mitch McConnell that he is going to be stepping down as the leader of the Republicans in the Senate. He is the longest serving member of any party to have led his party. And there's a lot to talk about with his legacy. And I think it's pretty clear at this point that Mitch McConnell paved the way for Donald Trump in many, many different ways. And we'll get into that. And so I am pleased to welcome Jennifer Taylor Skinner. Welcome to Theory of Change, Jennifer. Thank thank you, Matthew. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's it's exciting. And I'm glad to have you as a member of the Flux Network. And so before we get into the topic of the show, though, let's, uh, can you tell tell my audience and the Flux audience just a little bit about your show and uh, how long you've been doing it and, and what you do with it there? Sure. The electorate. It's a play on the word electorate, of course, electorate. I started the podcast, I think, in mid or late 2017. A lot of things were happening in 2017. We know what the biggest thing was. Of course, it was, you know, Trump's um, inauguration, the election after the 2016 election. Um, for me, I was really frustrated at all of the misogyny in the media and in the political discourse, you know, directed at Hillary Clinton. And we don't need to revisit that. <laughs> That was a huge problem. I mean, that was a huge problem and one of the primary reasons why I believe that she lost. And what I wanted to do with the electorate was to get people used to hearing women in leadership roles, hearing women express their expertise in the context of politics, because I think that's that that's part of the problem. If you look at some of the statistics, like very few of the experts back then at least, who were talking about politics on television were were women, right? And so that, I wanted to kind of change that with the electorate. And so what I do is on the electorate, I, I interview only women or people, anyone who isn't a, isn't a man about things that are really important in politics right now. Anything that's important to social justice or any cultural issues. And we kind of have these in-depth conversations about, you know, what's happening. And that's what the electorate is. And it's been really um, helpful for me. It's just been kind of cathartic for me after that kind of post 2016 PTSD or trauma we all have. Um, but yeah, so I've been doing it for a while now. It's, it feels like it hasn't been that long, but it's been a while. So that's what the electorate is. Yeah, and it, it's also, and it's also important. I, I, I do want to say, you know, from my standpoint that I, I feel like that the podcasting space, especially the political podcasting space doesn't have enough women in it as well. And that that's, uh, a serious problem, in, especially in terms of, but, you know, a lot of a lot, a lot of men, regardless of what their race, they don't have as much at stake when it comes to these far right policies that, you know, are being shoved on everybody now uh, with increasing frequency. You know, like the, a lot of them, they just it just doesn't it's not as real to a lot of men. And that's why I personally, you know, try to have as many women on my shows and, and work with women, uh, because I, I, that's, it is a, a, an imbalance that needs to be corrected. I think. Yeah. And I just want to clarify that is that a lot of people, when they think about podcasts, like the electorate, they think it's a show about women's issues and it's not because all issues are women's issues, yeah. right? It's about all issues. You know, we can talk about the economy. We, you know, we talk about climate change. The thing is, is that the, the conversations that you're getting are through the lens of women right? So climate change will affect everyone of all genders, all races. It'll affect some people more than others, but the solutions will look different through the lens of someone who is, you know, will be more affected through the lens of someone who's marginalized, through the lens of a woman. So that's what I wanted to do. So it isn't just about women's issues. You know, I mean, if you want to categorize abortion as a woman's issue, it's, you know, sure, that's fine. Um, Abortion isn't just a woman's issue. I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, so it yeah. isn't just issues like that. It's anything that you can think of, but through the lens of, of, of women. So men, you know, listen to the electorate too, or if you're not a man, anyone, everyone's welcome. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, and yeah, I'm excited for people to, to be able to do that in 
uh, somewhat greater numbers. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you on board. All right. So the, the news topic that we're going to go through today, I think, is that it, it's one that is pretty significant, is, which is that uh, Mitch McConnell, um, is, who is now the longest serving Senate majority leader in history, um, announced this week as we're recording that he was going to be residing in November. Um, and that he would serve out his, his term in office, um, but he would step down as the leader of the Senate Republicans. And, you know, and it's, uh, it's a little weird because I feel like to some degree, the, it didn't get as much coverage as I thought it would. Did, am, did you feel that way at all? Um, I mean, obviously we oh, have no. this hellish okay. news cycle. <laughs> right. We have a hellish news cycle. I mean, it- feel like so granted it only just happens right um and like you said we have a hellish news cycle i think there was a a a bombing or you know a a, a bomb um scare i think in alabama that happened you know on the same day around the same time so there's a lot of things to cover um and you know honestly that maybe there was probably more coverage of it online between you know politicos you know going on about you know why they're so happy that mitch mcconnell is, is stepping down um, I think that maybe some of the, some of the joy on the left, on our side, was maybe a little kind of premature or misplaced because, you know, Mitch McConnell, when he does step down as majority leader, he's going to be replaced by someone who is younger and who's probably more extreme. I'll just say that. Yeah. Well, and, and definitely somebody who will be more, uh, even more, you know, beholden to Donald Trump, um, because right. he's going to work very hard to, Try to put his stamp on that Senate leadership election. Trump, of course, was very instrumental in getting Mike Johnson to be the Speaker of the House, uh, because before originally the the guy who was going to take over from Kevin McCarthy was going to be Tom Emmert, who Trump explicitly said he did not want him to be the Speaker. And you know, magically, the party that 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 claims to hate cancel culture, magically, they canceled this guy and. Uh, he did not have a chance out. Um, and so, you know, Trump's, it'd be interesting to see who he tries to, you know, put his finger on the scale for. Uh, but that's definitely going to, you know, it's probably going to be a, a thing that's going to be a, a months long kind of summertime uh, discussion, perhaps. Um, whoever can kiss his ring the hardest, I guess. <laughs> Um, you know, the only exciting thing that I see, the thing worth celebrating in relation to um, Mr. McConnell stepping down is that, you know, regardless of who replaces him, he was pretty effective in bringing forth this kind of right wing Christian nationalist vision across the country, right, on a national level just in relation to his judicial appointments and reshaping the Supreme Court. And so why I think that him stepping down is, is, you know, a good thing for, you know, our side is that I can't imagine anyone replacing him who will be that effective. Right? I mean, he, you know, if you're on their side, he was really, really good at what he did. You know, just thinking of the Supreme Court judicial appointments, you know, the way that he finagled getting Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court and denying, you know, Obama a chance, President Obama a chance to appoint a Supreme Court justice and, you know, with um, Merrick Garland, you know, and then flipping the script when Ruth Bader Ginsburg got died. And then within weeks, having hearings for Amy Coney Barrett. Like that was kind of, if not, I, I hate to use the word evil, but, you know, it was, it was kind of masterful. And I can't imagine, yeah. I can't envision anyone on the Republican side being as effective as he's been, right? So if anything, that possibly could be a good thing for Democrats who get someone, you know, it's kind of a, a, a circus right now, you know, yeah. thinking of who's who's left, who's remaining. Yeah, and that is actually a good point because when you look at the House side of things, they're just in complete and total chaos uh, and they all hate each other. And they're all constantly going after each other and tearing at each other's throats. Um, and as a result, you, they really can't pass uh, anything like this, you know, because uh, under the Johnson speakership, you know, this has been the most unproductive Congress in terms of bills passed um, 
you know, in a very, very long time. I think depending on the metric, uh, you know, at, at least, you know, in the past hundred years or, um, and I, I'd heard somebody claim it was since the civil war, but I, I didn't look up the stat on it. Um, but yeah, no. And, and I think that that's, that's a, a great point. And it's also, it's also funny though, uh, because the, the right wing hates Benjamin. <laughs> right, right. Um, and right. you know, and, and it was funny because when I was on the in in the right wing media space, um, I liked Mitch McConnell because I did see him as effective and skilled at uh, you know at, at legislative strategy and tactics. Um, and I would tell that to my fellow Republicans who hated him, and they just they did not want to hear it. <laughs> right. Right. Well, look what we have now, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> lots of people did see Roe v. Wade being overturned, but you can you can chalk that up to Mitch McConnell, right? It's on his plate. Oh, yeah. He did that, right? Affirmative action. All of those really huge decisions that have gone through the Supreme Court are due to his remake of the Supreme Court by, you know, not only did he um, make, you know, over 200 ju- judicial appointments broadly, but, you know, he, you know, there were three justices on the Supreme Court under, you know, Trump due to Mitch McConnell and his leadership, I guess. Um, yeah. And speaking of, yeah, speaking of the House side, um, we were mentioning the House. Um, Hakeem Jeffries had Nancy Pelosi as his mentor, presumably, right? They work very closely together. And he's been very effective. He will be very effective, you know, if, you know, Democrats gain, make, regain the majority there. Whoever takes over for Mitch McConnell because Mitch McConnell is, his health status is kind of questionable. We don't really know what's happening with him. You know, not, they're not being very transparent with that. We're not really sure if there will be that kind of back and forth mentorship, right? Will he be able to mentor someone to be the kind of leader that he has been in the Senate? I I very much doubt it. So that's another good thing for Democrats, hopefully. Yeah. Well, and, and on the judiciary side of things, um, you know, besides reshaping it you know in a, a pretty much a wholesale fashion because of how long he was the leader um he the what he did with that is is really important because he i think he understood before almost any other republican that the public isn't going to vote for their explicit agenda um so you know they're not the public isn't going to vote for privatizing social social security they're not going to vote to criminalize abortion they're not going to vote to get rid of same-sex marriage they're not going to vote to eliminate the department of education you know get rid of uh, the affordable health care act they're not they don't want any of these things that republicans have been obsessed with for decades right those uh, you know those ideas are unpopular but mcconnell figured out that if he could rig the judicial system in favor of republicans they could still get those outputs through the courts in a way that would also not jeopardize their electoral futures i mean it is incredible what he figured out in that regard because basically that strategy has allowed you know because the republican party is very different compared to right-wing parties outside of the United States in, in the industrialized world, right. they're much, much more radical. They're much further to the right. And that happened because of Mitch McConnell, even though right. he, ex- you know, was not on the, you know, he wasn't directly aligned with the Freedom Caucus types. Um, he protected them through the filibuster and through his takeover. Right, 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 exactly. And, you know, although he, you can't get the majority of the public to vote for those specific legislative aims, right? You can get them to vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> for some reason, there's a disconnect there. And presumably it's because Donald Trump doesn't really talk about legislation at all, right? I mean, he, he kind of skirts around it. He basically just talks about his grievances when he does rallies. You know, he's only recently started to talk about abortion, saying that, you know, he's up for like a 16-week abortion ban. I think he's reduced it to 15 weeks. Um, but the people who are steadfast Trump voters are not really, I don't think they're really listening to that, right? Um, they're just voting for their man, Donald Trump. So 
Yeah, it was a it was a really good marriage there, Trump and McConnell together to kind of remake the country in in their image. Yeah. It's not really good, great for everyone else, but um, actually, <laughs> it's not really good for anyone. It's not good for anyone, even the people who are voting for Trump. It's actually terrible for them, and you know, hopefully someday they will wake up and see it. I doubt it, uh, but yeah, yeah, and um, and it is, and that combination, it is, it's been really important because. I think the other thing about McConnell is that, you know, because he is, you know, uh, very, he's very intelligent. He, you know, is well dressed. He's well spoken. He's articulate. Uh, I mean, he's not particularly exciting, but, you know, he, his stature within the Republican party gave permission to a lot of people who are, you know, sort of white collar, um, you know, upper middle class people to, to be like, well, see, this is still the same Republican Party th- that it was always. Um, that tr- Trump didn't, he didn't take care, you know, he didn't become a dictator. We, we constrained him. We, we hemmed him in. And, you know, and, 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 and he really gave them permission to, to think that. And so, like, it, it'll be interesting with him gone if that affects anybody's permission structure. I don't know. Huh, that's interesting because I think Mike Johnson also gives that same appearance, right? They give this appearance of kind of these, you know, non-emotional, rational, intellectual Republicans. But if you step back and you look at their positions, they're essentially the same as Donald Trump, right? Um, Mike Johnson is a very extreme. I know we're talking about the House again. He's a very extreme. I mean, we don't need to go into him, but um, but yeah, I could see how Mitch McConnell, you know, has that image of, you know, being kind of a non-reactionary. You know, compare him to someone like, I don't know, who's on the Senate now that, um, that is the Josh Hawley that. would be an example. Josh Hawley. Yeah, that's uh, a great example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, um, and, and he has a better, you know, and, and, and it's who knows what the guy believes because he never really talks about it <laughs> in terms of religion. Um Right. But, you know, at the very least, he knows not to wear it on his sleeve the way that a Josh Hawley or, you know, some of these other people, you know, very much are interested in doing. Um, and that's important because, uh, and, and, and I'm speaking from my own personal experience here that, you know, when I was on the right wing, that as a secular conservative person, you know, I really wanted to believe that people like me you know, were equal partners in the party or even slightly above. I didn't want to, I desperately did not want to think that I was, you know, in some sort of j- junior arrangement with religious fanatics. Um, because, I mean, the reality is, you know, the people who have these extreme, you know, viewpoints about whether it's uh, suppressing women or going after non Christians or, um, you know, anti LGBTQ stuff or racist stuff, you know, like they, fortunately, they are still a pretty small minority. They are a sm- they are a minority in the United States. Um, mm-hmm. but they're, you know, they have a lot of power within the Republican party and, and Mitch McConnell gave them that power. He knew who they were. He knew what they wanted. And, you know, he decided, well, I want to be the Senate Majority Leader, so I'm going to go along with it. Um, right. And that was, yeah. Yeah, right. And you're right. He is kind of a, a closed book. It's hard to know what he's thinking. I think the most emotive I've ever seen him was, you know, during the Obama administration, during Obama's term, he said, you know, my, my goal is to make, you know, Obama a one-term president. That's probably the most emotion I've ever seen from the man. <laughs> <laughs> he was, you know, like bordering on anger, I guess, perhaps. Um, but yeah, it's he, he's a he's a closed book that one. Um, yeah, and I think he said that he believed his most significant accomplishment was keeping Merrick Garland off the Supreme Court, which yeah. you know that's probably accurate um, to right. say, and uh, right. certainly un- unfortunate um, as well. So, um, but I mean, the other thing about McConnell that I think is worth thinking about and talking about is in the context of him as sort of the the last survivor of the Ronald Reagan republicanism. So when I think about those years, one of the things that I do remember about Mitch McConnell is that, and that's really relevant in the battle that's happening right now with aid for Ukraine, is, um, you know, he used to be a staunch supporter of NATO. 
And that used to be an issue that you could um, count on on either side of the aisle, right? Republicans and Democrats, you know, during those years, yeah. he was a staunch re- supporter of NATO. And now that's all off the table. And that's specifically due to whatever Trump has going with, with Putin. Uh, yeah, and it's also that, uh, you know, McConnell was, in his line of thought, it, it was more of the, you know, robust uh, and militaristic foreign policy tradition, whereas Trump clearly identifies more with the, you know, libertarian isolationist kind of thing, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not really sure Trump thinks about foreign policy that deeply. I mean, that's another conversation. I mean, I think that he's just taking direction from some unknown, invisible, you know, source. Um, I really don't think that he thinks about foreign policy that, yeah, I don't think he has a philosophy, right? I don't think, it, you know, even libertarianism. Yeah. I mean, he, the isolation, if he is an isolationist, and, it, you know, he arguably is, it's not an idea that came from his own own head. It's it's to yeah. it's disadvantage the the you know d- d- disadvantage democracy to to disadvantage us in some way. Mm. I mean, I think you know what I'm getting at, and you know, again, that's a whole other conversation. Mm-hmm. But we could talk about the specific people if you mm-hmm. want. But to be honest, like those articles, and I've seen mm-hmm. a couple of people do those articles. Yeah, I don't yeah. know that that's necessarily going to be the only candidates that are going to be no. along because, like RFK Jr. <laughs> for some reason endorsed uh Rand Paul uh to be the Senate majority um yeah so I know, I know, yeah. what do you think do you think it's worth talking about the, and these other people or not really uh not really I mean because honestly I've seen the names that have been floating around mainstream media mm-hmm. um or the people who might replace McConnell but I have a feeling that it's going to be a wild card it's someone that we that we yeah. haven't thought of kind of like Mike Johnson right and whoever that person is going to be, they're going to be younger and they're going to be very extreme. Um, the only thing that I think that, that we might have going for us is the fact that they, they won't have that strategic mind that Mitch McConnell has and they'll be less effective in the end. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, it'll, I think that's right. I think that's what will happen and probably we'll have more chaos in the Senate Republican caucus, which. It's certainly bad for America, but it is good that they can't get their act together. (laughs) Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. In some ways, yes. Um, We do need two functioning parties. Yeah, um, although we don't need a strong Republican Party. Thank you. No. (laughs) Yes, we don't. We don't need a strong Republican Party. Yeah, I guess before we move on from McConnell, though, I did want to touch on that in some of the the valedictory coverage or re- review of McConnell coverage that you're going to see, this idea that he was some sort of opponent to Donald Trump. Um, and I think that that's only barely true. Um, so to the extent that they opposed each other, it was, be- it was a matter of particular strategy for specific events. Right. It wasn't their overall agenda. They agreed on most things overall because they're in the same party and you know and i mean ultimately when mitch mcconnell had that chance to go after you know to get rid of trump he could have gotten rid of him during that second impeachment you know because the house explicitly impeached trump before he had left office and left several days for that trial to happen while he was president and Mitch McConnell deliberately refused to try Donald Trump during that time window. And then after Trump had left office, uh, um, and then after Trump had left office, explicitly said, well, we can't vote to convict him because he's not the president anymore. And yeah. then not acknowledging at any point in time that, oh, and I made it so that that was the case. Uh, yeah so, i mean just really really dishonest um and and like ultimately he never opposed trump in any meaningful way and right i really hope that the mainstream media doesn't uh doesn't lie or get that wrong right i mean the thing is if there's one consistent thing about mitch mccall mitch mccall or one reliable thing is the fact that he he is interested in furthering conservative power no matter how that happens. And I think that he realized at some point that, 
you know, supporting Donald Trump, you know, supporting him by just being quiet or like letting him get away with things was helpful in him furthering conservative power for the long term, right? You know, he probably didn't like Donald Trump's style. You know, he's probably a bit of a snob in that sense, you know? Um, but he realized that, that A, they, like you said, they, neither of them have scruples. <laughs> Um, that's the one thing they have in common. And they kind of made, you know, an uncommon, you know, atypical pairing that kind of worked well for furthering this extreme right wing agenda on a national level. They kind of worked well together, even if they're nothing alike, even if they don't like each other personally. And so I think Mr. McConnell at some point realized that Trump was, was useful in helping him further that agenda, maybe faster than he realized that, you know, he could do it on his own. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, uh, one of the, the things I often say is that it's important to, for people to distinguish that most of what calls itself conservative in America is actually reactionary. It is right. not conservative. Um, because a conservative is somebody who wants to keep things how they are, whereas a reactionary wants to roll back modernity and attack the foundations that everyone except as their, as, as, you know, as our current way of life, like a uh, conservative would be in favor of keeping Roe versus Wade, for instance, um, rather than wanting to overturn it. Um, yeah. and, you know, and, and, and McConnell, I think, you know, it, it really illustrates kind of that, that the partnership of between conservatism and reactionism, that they are allies ultimately. And that, and, you know, that a conservative generally speaking is not going to oppose reactionism. I I guess the other person, though, that kind of is at that intersection is Nikki Haley, though. Um, and for if McConnell was sort of the last empowered conservative in Republican politics, she's kind of like the, I don't know, like the, the dying breath of, of, of that Reagan conservatism, um, if you will. You know, it's really hard to pin Nikki Haley down, right? I, I, I can't really get a, a good sense of who she wants to be politically and who she wants to be seen as broadly. You know, in some senses and in, in some ways, you know, she wants to parrot the most extreme right wing talking points, right? When she was given a chance to clarify the Republican or the conservative position on, you know, what was the cause of the Civil War, you know, which was clear, clearly slavery. She said something like it was just freedoms or some something random, right? She didn't give the right answer. She knows what yeah. the right answer is. She knows what the right answer is, but she performed the most extreme right-wing answer that she knew was floating around at the time. And the same thing with IVF. If you'd asked Nikki Haley about IVF five years ago or three years ago, she would not say what she did the other day in her interview with... um her interview, I think it was on MSNBC, she said, you know, I think of embryos as babies. Actually, let me get her exact quote. She said, um, you can cut this out. Yeah, yeah. Um, she said, you know, in her interview, I think it was on MSNBC, she goes, embryos are, are babies to me. To me, embryos are babies. You know, yeah. newsflash, that's the wrong answer. That's the wrong answer, <laughs> but it's the extreme answer, right? And she's in this really interesting position where, you know, people who are at the far extreme of conservatism right now usually fall in line under Trump. You know, they, they fall on their, their Trump voters, their MAGA. Um, but she is also taking these extreme positions, but she's also one of the only Republicans who, who is, you know, openly and publicly speaking out against Trump, right? So I'm not really sure what, who she's hoping to capture, who her audience is and what she's planning to do. I mean, one theory I have is that she's hoping something will happen. <laughs> she she's hoping something yeah. will happen to Trump, and that 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 that's my longstanding theory that she's hoping that you know one of these cases will come through in her favor and she'll be elected because she's not winning any of the primaries. Um, no, but 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 I don't I don't know. I, she's not in touch with who the conservative base is right now. Um, I think it's clear to them that. She is just parroting these points and she may or may not actually believe them. Um, so anyway, that's my, that's my first take on the Nikki Haley. Yeah. Well, and, and when you look at the, the exit poll results, I mean, yeah, to your point that she's, you know, getting nowhere, anywhere close to the majority of, you know, self identified Republican voters in the primaries. And, you know, she's getting, 
independents and Democrats. That's who is voting for her. But she also doesn't want to speak to them (laughs) or like actually court, you know, like figure out, well, why are these people voting for me? What do they want? How can I give them what they want? Uh, Instead, she keeps, you know, grasping in vain for the MAGA coalition, which despises her, Um, you know, and that's been and she's been doing this. And and all the all the Republican candidates who ran against Trump, except for Chris Christie, they all followed this same strategy. They refused to tell the truth about him. Um, And then, you know, as a result, uh, the 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 voters kind of well, they didn't choose them. You know, like it's it's hilarious that Republicans Republican consultants always love to say, "Well, you need to draw distinctions between the the parties and the candidates." That's what will make voters go to you. if you do that, but they never did that with Donald Trump. They never, and, 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 and they were all afraid. They were all afraid of, of him, um, you know, that, that he would attack them, even though, of course, he still attacked them anyway. Like that was, that's the even more absurd situation about it is that, you know, they thought somehow that if they didn't attack him directly or in a, in a, you know, a uh, tough fashion, that it would somehow redound to their benefit. And it never did. And this didn't work in 2016 either. It's just, it was amazing right. to me, the incompetence uh, and, and timidity um, yeah. from Republicans with him. You know, another interesting thing about Nikki Haley's place right now in the Republican Party and, you know, also running against Trump in this primary is that Donald Trump never has to say her name. He laid the groundwork for how his base feels about people like Nikki Haley long before she ran against him. He laid the groundwork for how conservatives and Republicans feel about people like Nikki Haley way back in 2015, arguably. And he was making all of those misogynistic points about Hillary Clinton. He was telling his base how to feel about women as leaders, right? And that is, that's, that's the um, context within you know, where Nikki Haley is stepping into. The Republican Party and conservatives do not like women. You know, arguably, they've never really liked women. And they like women even less thanks to Donald Trump, right? So he he doesn't have to utter her name. They don't like brown people. Nikki Haley, you know, of course, is Indian American. They don't like brown people. They don't like women. And also, you know, he's been making comments about the way women look. You know, if they aren't, you know, young and blonde, you know, like his daughter, (laughs) You know, that's also a strike against them. Um, so he's laid the groundwork. She, you know, he doesn't have to say her name at all. And I think that that's one of the, the, the challenges among many that she has. Yeah, no, good point. And she herself also is kind of illustrative of this wandering that right wing women are all in. Because like when you, you know, when, when I was on the, on the right wing that all the women that I knew who worked in Republican politics, all of them, with the exception of two, they knew hundreds of women. Um, all of them, except for two, were very religious. All of them. Um, because, like, you know, they, if you're not super religious, there just isn't really any incentive to be in the Republican Party if you're a woman. Um, and because the party is, as you said, you know, it is actively hostile to you. It, it is trying to take, you know, control of your body. Late last month, there was a controversy on the right wing about uh, a video that was posted on TikTok of some mm-hmm. women dancing. Um, and, you know, these reactionary Christians and, and their incel allies, they were enraged about this, that this was, you know, it looked like some sorority had put together a group event to go to Mar- a Mardi Gras party. And so they were dancing to this local uh, rapper, uh, who wrote a song about a, a guy that just goes around and films Louisianans having a good time, uh, mm-hmm. and does and really and like th- that guy. The guy actually is a is a is a fun. Um, he's really a fun personality because you know what he does is he really does show like there is something that is special and unique about the culture of Louisiana, uh, especially in regards to the South. Like it is, it is a really integrated place where people of all races are hanging out and having a good time and acknowledging and sharing in each other's humanity, not just, you know, sharing a drink or a cigarette, but, you know, like 
actually being there with each other and, and right. hanging out with each other. Like that right. is my favorite thing absolutely about New Orleans and, and that whole culture. Um, yeah. which of course is why the right wing was so angry about it because you can't have a bunch of white women dancing to a rap song. Uh, right. that's not, that's not allowed. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, wow. That's a whole other show. We could go on about that. Um, yeah, I agree with you about New Orleans. I love New Orleans. It is a place where, you know, there is a lot of, you know, cultural intermingling, uh, <laughs> You know, the thing about that video and the, the sorority girls or the sorority women, rather, um, it's white women, you know, dancing to this rap song. Yeah. When I first heard about that story, I mean, the first thing that came to mind is that their, their ire, their anger towards Taylor Swift. I don't know if you made that connection, but, um, mm, yeah, they have I'm an expectation. That. Yeah, that's right. They have an expectation of white women, right? Especially white women that look a certain way, but they adhere to certain cultural values, right? Um, and so publicly they were saying, you know, oh, Taylor Swift were mad at her because she might endorse Biden, right? That doesn't really, that never really made sense to me. What they're angry about is, is that I, I think this is just my theory that they are, um, that they are, you know, uh, what, what's the word? I had a great word in my head <laughs> that mm -hmm. they suspect that, or they are upset that she is a, you know, um, I guess messing with the NFL, but her boyfriend, Travis Kelsey, um, you know, he is kind of very similar to that culture that you might see in New Orleans and that, you know, he's kind of, you know, has one foot in black culture. You know, he's not, yeah. he's not, you know, he's not, um, Tom Brady, right. Mm -hmm. Um, his longtime girlfriend before Taylor Swift was a, was a black woman. Right. And I think that's just a little bit too cold. I don't know if you know that. Did you know that? I didn't know that. No, I don't know. Yeah, and so I think, so that's been my theory about one reason. Like maybe they're not aware of that. I think Taylor Swift is just, you know, mm -hmm. flirting too close culturally outside of what they think white women should be and how they should behave. If that makes any sense. Oh, yeah. I mean, throughout history, it has always been the case that, you know, reactionaries, especially uh, religious fundamentalists, one of their top priorities is controlling the bodies you know, of women. And whether it's controlling them, you know, what they can do with their reproduction, but also just what they're allowed to do in public, um, that, you know, they basically, you know, should be kept that they are communal property. That's what women are. They, they do not, they are not human. They have no human rights. They are there to serve men. And, you know, by this, you know, this collection of women just out there having a, and, you know, and, and, and maybe they didn't know that this was from a Mardi Gras uh, clip. Perhaps they didn't know that. Um, and that's what this, I mean, you know, you, you go to, anyone goes to New Orleans in February or, or the entire state of Louisiana, that's, you're going to see this scene, you know, <laughs> hundreds of times um, right. because that's just what it is. But, you know, like, let's say they didn't know that, um, you know, shorn of the context. Yeah, it, it was, it was a violation of the social contract that they envisioned for their women and they think of them as their women um right. these, th that women do not have agency they do not have uh yeah they don't have agency over any aspect they should not have agency over any aspect of their life that's what this right. really the freak out really was about um, right but i agree with that and you know bringing this back to around to nikki haley so there is no there is no environment in conservatism where a woman could really truly be in leadership, right? Because you can't not have yeah. agency and also lead. So I'm not really sure what she's doing. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, 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 and it says, you know, in the Bible explicitly that, you know, a woman should not be over a man and a woman's desire should be to her husband. And, you know, like that's, and, and, and I, and I always love what if, watching that interplay between right-wing women because like that was you know seeing all of that rage against these against these women just for dancing in public and having a good, good time um and they were not being sexualized in any way in their behavior not really at all um you know they were modestly clothed if uh if that's a thing that you're supposed to do <laughs> but whatever <laughs> yeah. like there's not really any basis that they could have criticized them. Um, 
you know, and they weren't doing drugs. But so a lot of these right wing Christian women, you know, they looked at that, that this outrage of the of the of the far right um, Christians, uh, especially the men, but even some of the a lot of the women, you know, like they looked at that and and they were appalled by it because it was going against everything that they're trying to do, which is to keep because like basically like th- there's this saying that uh right wing christians have about uh, and and that have about people who are lesbian or gay which is they cannot reproduce so they must recruit you ever heard that one oh no i haven't i've been away for long <laughs> enough thankfully i haven't heard that one <laughs> and that's not true uh needless to say because of course there are plenty of people who are bisexual you know or who, even who you know might identify as exclusively homosexual who might occasionally have heterosexual sex like that's yeah. not true uh yeah. independently of that not being true you know they themselves the the christian right is actually in this situation now where they actually cannot recruit uh right. because you know like and that there's and, you know, I would love to hear from people, if you know of anyone, um, mm-hmm. of a woman who has willingly, you know, converted to far-right Christianity. I just don't see that happening, you know, unless right. you were brainwashed from, in, you know, as a girl into having some guilt and, you know, desire, you know, desire that this is the right thing for you to do. Um, unless you, you know, if you had no contact with you know, uh, right, uh, Christianity of any kind. Mm-hmm. I don't think that any woman is going to sign up for far right Christianity. So, and then at the same time, their, their ideas are also so, there's claims about the world, you know, evolution is not true. The earth is 6,000 years old. You know, there was a flood of Noah, you know, uh, and, uh, there was a burning bush. And, you know, I mean, all this stuff that is just ludicrous and, you know, more mature Christians don't believe happened there were no ancient jewish people in egypt that that massively came out like none of that's true um yeah. and so like mature christians don't believe that but because those beliefs are so absurd and so obviously absurd now people are not signing up for this stuff so they can't recruit and so they must reproduce like right. the irony right. of this situation um, and so, you know, and like, and like, and I think that that ultimately is kind of the, 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 the main reason why they are so obsessed with controlling women, because if they can control women's ability, you know, to have children, uh, and, and, you know, do it at their command, then they still have at least some semblance of a chance of the future. Um, right. because they sure as hell aren't getting converts in the United States. Right, right. Which I guess brings us around to what happened, I guess, was it earlier this week or was it last week? The IVF decision out of Alabama, which, sorry, I just <laughs> shifted the conversation on you. Um, oh, no, it's all right. Um, yeah, well, and yeah, and that's another example of that, that, you know, uh, and I think Tommy, Tommy Tub- Tuberville, when he was asked about it, he was like, well, we need more babies. Um, and it's like, who, who, who says that? Nobody says that. <laughs> Like we right. have plenty of people in this country and there's plenty of people coming in. Like if, you know, it's not your business, uh, however many babies there are or are not. Uh, and if you really yeah. believe that you would give incentives for, you know, you would approve uh mandated maternity leave and federally funded maternity leave and paternity leave. If you actually right. believe that you would do right. these things. They're not, they don't have any consistency of being pro-life quote unquote. Because they love the death right. penalty, you know, right, exactly. and, uh, and then, you know, and, and even with the IVF stuff, you know, like you are seeing that the national party is, is at least pretending to support IVF, um, because I mean, as a I'm polling matter, like there's plenty of Republican families that have done it, but this is, this is a great example of how, you know, this is a party that has become so much more radicalized, you know, just in the past, let's say 10 years or so, maybe since the Tea Party, um, that, you know, t- 10, 12 years that, you know, they, they, they have to maintain this fiction for people. Right. I think, you know, and yeah. especially for women. Like, I mean, is that, 
in your own travels and work and whatnot, like have, have you seen women who have this, you know, fiction about the Republican Party? What are, have you seen that? I personally don't know anyone in my sphere of friends <laughs> or, you know, my oh, community. Okay. Well, you're lucky. <laughs> right. Because I, I, I think that it's obvious, right? I think it's, it's very obvious. I mean, you have people saying, I mean, you think about, you know, five years ago, even just, I was going to say 10 years ago, but even five years ago, the idea of granting an embryo in the freezer personhood would be, we would, we would have laughed at that. We would have literally laughed at that, you know, 10 years ago, you know. Um, so I don't know anyone who can't see that, that the two parties are, are not the same, right? And I'm kind of thankful for that. Um, yeah, so that's all I have. That's, that's the answer to your question. I, I don't know anyone who thinks that, thankfully, right? I mean, it's just so obvious on yeah, so yeah, many different levels, right? And, and so many different ways and in, in, in legislation, so, yeah. Yeah, but unfortunately, though, like, I mean, the national media to a large degree does, you know, operate under that fiction um, in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I'm not really certain why they do that. I think maybe, you know, part of our conversation, I think we were having it earlier offline about, you know, some of the, the editors or people behind the scenes could be more conservative than they are liberal or progressive. I don't really understand how they aren't. I mean, I understand in that they believe that they should, you know, report on the parties equally, but that's under normal circumstances. We we aren't under normal circumstances, right? We are skirting with or flirting with rather authoritarianism, right? And, you know, having these extreme ideas and legislation take over the country. So they have an obligation to report that the two parties are not the same. And, you know, and I think, you know, for the most part, and it just be it could just could it could be biased because of the news stations that I'm watching. That you know the reporters that I'm watching aren't really saying that, but enough are that it's not really making it out to, you know, all of the constituents. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I guess maybe let's wrap then. What do you think are kind of the big um, themes that we're going to see emerging in the in the general election in the presidential contest? Oh well. Oh, the general election, it's, you know, I'm curious as to where this IBF case will land in terms of voters, particularly white women. I mean, me as a black woman, I'm always thinking. And so when I go into general election, the thing that's foremost on my mind, I'm not thinking about what will black people do, right? That, that doesn't worry about me, right? I worry about, you know, how will white women vote, right? Because they've been kind of voting for Republicans for a really long time. And because they're voting against their own interests, you know, it kind of affects all of us. So I think we have to watch for that because the IVF decision, the majority of people who use IVF are white women. It's that demographic that the Republicans rely on. Um, you know, um, it, their, their affirmative action is also something that will affect them. So I think it's something to watch out. Like, where is the needle going? And I'm curious if, you know, if we look deeper at that breakdown of voters for Nikki Haley, those kind of independents or those, you know, people who are voting for her over Trump. I wonder if those are, you know, white women who are hoping to, you know, not bring on another Trump term, but can't bring themselves to vote for Democrats. Um, so that's something to watch out for. Um, I guess the second thing that I'm, that's foremost on my mind is misinformation and disinformation, right? Um, that's a huge one. It's kind of this invisible monster. Um, you yeah, know, thinking back, Three years ago, I can't remember how long it's been since um, Elon Musk took over Twitter, you know, or the X, formerly known as Twitter. But, you know, we were all hand wringing about the disinformation that's going to, you know, kind of be proliferated in that space. And we just kind of like, you know, we stopped talking about that. And I think the assumption is that it's something that's going to happen in the future, right? It's kind of in the back of our minds that it's something that's going to happen. Well, we're in the middle of it right now. Right. Every time right. you watch a video or you get a headline or some, you know, read something online, especially with, you know, all of the upheaval, you know, in relation to our foreign policy, you should assume that that information has been manipulated in some way and you should always double check. Right. So we are in the middle of the disinformation age of social media, specifically on Twitter. You're living it right now. Right. And I don't really know if there are any measures to counter that. I mean, Twitter is a, a private company, but that's something that 
kind of frankly keeps me up at night. So that's that's probably the second thing. Um, and I guess, uh, sorry, I guess a you know close third would be you know f- foreign interference in our election. Um, and that's you know related to the disinformation. We still really haven't gotten to the bottom of 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 that. What happened in 2016? Actually, I think we have gotten to the bottom of it, but you know the media doesn't really cover that. I, I had a guest on um, a couple of weeks ago on the electorate, Jackie Singh. You know, she's a cybersecurity expert, and we were talking about that and how whenever you talk about disinformation or whenever you talk about foreign interference in an election in an election cycle. There's kind of this collective eye roll, I think, you know, among people, especially people on social media or people who think that they're really tied yeah. into, um, into social the media. The Russia collusion hoax. Uh, yeah. Right, exactly. And it's just like, well, you know, it's, you know, th- these are conspiracies. So there have been legitimate organizations who've uncovered that these things have happened. And I think that, frankly, the collective eye roll, that reaction has been part of the manipulation that we've all been under, right? If you, you know, we've somehow been taught to dismiss mm-hmm. it and to downplay it, right? Um, which doesn't really make sense to me. Oh, um, yeah. So that's yeah. those are the three things. And I, you know, honestly, I, there's a fourth thing. I guess I'll lump those last two things together as number two. <laughs> but but the the third thing I think is, you know, there are judges planted around planted around the country, conservative judges who are willing to, um, you know, they had a playbook from 2020. They know what to do and what not to do to help you know, Donald Trump win a, you know, take over an election that he hasn't actually won. And I'm just, I'm, I'm a little nervous about how that will play out. You know, um, Biden and has state done, legislatures as well. And state legislatures. Exactly. So I'm very worried about how that will, that will play out. Um, there are people who are sitting in, you know, willing and waiting to help Donald Trump you know, steal an election. Steal yeah. an election. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 try, I try to avoid saying that word because they also accuse us of stealing an election. But I mean, the, it's like they're the ones who stole the election. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, no, I think those are definitely all things to keep an eye out. And um, I think that uh, we, uh, yeah, it's been a great discussion. And I look forward to having everybody see a lot more of you in the future. Uh, Flux and uh, on this show and some of the other uh, the other ones that we're doing. So I'm really excited. No, yeah, thank you so much for having me, Matthew. It's really fun. I love talking to you. And so for people who uh, want to keep tabs on what you're doing on social media, what's what's the best way for them? Well, I'm mostly on Twitter, fortunately or unfortunately, at mm-hmm. J Taylor Skinner, right? Or Twitter. Formerly known as Twitter, I'm on, on X as J Taylor Skinner, right? I don't really do Facebook that often, mm. but yeah, find me on Twitter, ranting or, or two ends. about something. Two ends, oh. that's right. J, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, awesome. All right, so that is the program for today. I appreciate everybody joining us for the conversation. You can always get more if you go to theoryofchange.show. You can get the video, audio, and transcript of all the episodes. And if you are a paid subscribing member, you have unlimited access. Thank you very much for your support. That makes it possible. And if you can't afford to support at this time financially, um, you can actually really help out the show by subscribing on whatever platform you are using to listen to podcasts. And if you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, that's actually really helpful as well. It helps people see the show a written review review can be even just as short as one sentence saying it's great, five stars. That's much appreciated. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can just click the like and subscribe button. Please do that. I really appreciate that. So that'll do it for this episode. I'll see everybody next time.